Well, for those who have been playing at home, I'm now in the second half of a four-week run of looking for the presence of God in these sort of disparate stories that we get in the gospel over this early part of the summer. Two weeks ago in the story about the storm at sea, I talked about the presence of God in crisis and chaos. Last week in some healing stories, it was about the presence of God in transformation and despair that turns into something new and different. Let me see if I can manage to carry this on for two more weeks. Sometimes you start these things really strong and you have an idea where you're going and you get to the middle. This is kind of what I was talking about the first week and now I find myself in that position. But I'm going to finish strong. Today we have stories of Jesus coming to his hometown and sending out his followers. I want to start though by talking about a completely different story which is from the last of the Narnia books in which C.S. Lewis gives a kind of a, a, a kind and gentle rendering of the story of Revelation, the, the end of the world, the judgment of all of creation. And in that story, there, there are various elements that speak to different people at different points in their lives, but the one that I think is relevant today for us is there's a group of characters who are dwarves who have been taken prisoner and are being held captive in a stable. And while they're held captive in the stable, the, the end of time comes and Aslan, the, the, the Messiah, comes and everything is transformed. In fact, he goes to the stable and blows out the walls of it, gives them food and drink and, and richness in their lives, but they are unable or unwilling to see it. Based on what they say, in their heads, they're still sitting in the stable with the walls still there, surrounded by dirty straw and whatever else you would find in a stable, unable to recognize what it is God has done for them, or that God is even standing right there next to them saying, you fools, look what I just did. Their belief, or their failure to believe, their, their disbelief, their unbelief is so strong that they can't get past it. We'll come back to that in a minute, but I think it's worth for a, a second thinking about what we mean by belief because we use the term all the time in our lives. I don't know that we necessarily know what kind is relevant here. Sometimes we'll say to somebody, I believe in you, whether it's your, your child, your spouse, your parent, your, a student, whoever it may be. I have some experience of you. I know what you're capable of. Uh, I know what I, what I hope for you. And so I believe in you. You're, you're going to do this. In a way, it's belief against anything we might think in the back of our head, well, maybe that won't happen. It, it's belief, hope against hope, as we say. I don't think that's what we're talking about when we talk about God. I might also say, particularly this week, I believe it's going to rain today. Unfortunately, it probably will not rain today, and my grass will be the worst for it. But that's a different kind of belief also. That means I watched the weather, weather Channel this morning and I got some information from them. I know roughly how often they're right and how often they're wrong. I know roughly how accurate the science of meteorology is. And so weighing up the chances for and the chances against, on balance, I think it's more likely that it will. This also is not what we mean when we talk about belief in God. I think when we talk about belief in God, we're not really talking about anything that God does or anything that God might produce around us in any way, what we're saying is we believe that God is. Because unless God is, there's nothing much that God can do. And so when we talk about belief and unbelief, it is something about that basic nature of what it is that organizes the entire universe. Think about this. Even to this day, when you read the propaganda of modern worshipers of the devil, and literal worshippers of the devil, and modern atheists. Both of them spend most of their time trying to refute the arguments of any form of belief. They have to use our terminology and work on our turf because there's something about belief that is deeply inside us. This principle of the existence of God that organizes everything else flowing out from it. That is what we mean by belief. Then we have to turn back quickly to the dwarves and what it is that they're doing. The other thing we have to be clear about is that we tend to use the words unbelief and disbelief more or less interchangeably. They don't exactly mean the same thing. Unbelief is usually described as, I really want to believe, but I can't. 
Elsewhere in the Bible, there's a character who comes to Jesus asking for a healing miracle and says, I believe, help my unbelief. So it's about being somewhere in the ballpark, but not quite being able to, to get over the last line to mix metaphors. Depends what kind of ballpark, I guess. Disbelief, on the other hand, is to say, I don't believe, I don't even want to believe. I think what we hear in the story this morning and what we face in the world increasingly nowadays as faithful people is disbelief rather than unbelief. So what I want to talk about this morning is the presence of God in the face of disbelief. But first, as I've been doing with these sermons, I want to give you a few clues, a few keys that we find, the phrases that are in these stories that tell us kind of what's going on. The first one that's important to note is Jesus came to his hometown. He's gone back to where they know him. He grew up there. He was probably the kid that ran around the village. Everybody knows him. Everybody has some experience of him. But he's gone away, and something has happened in the time that he's been away, and now he's come back, and he's somebody different. And they're not quite sure what to make of it. When Deacon Sheila read the gospel at this service, when I read it, the last service, we were careful to read it in, in church voice. Uh, this happened and that happened. And it's all very flat and, and pious. But you shouldn't be fooled. When you hear those lines, what is this wisdom and what are these deeds of power? I suspect what they were actually saying is, what is this wisdom? What are these deeds of power that he's doing? This is, this is a guy we know. None of this makes any sense to us. Having changed, they're not quite sure what to make of him, and they're not quite sure how to believe in who he is anymore. At a much more basic level, putting on my public health hat for a minute, we had the same experience during COVID. At the beginning of it, data began to accumulate, and the public health system began to make recommendations to people about what you should do and shouldn't do. You may recall way, way, way back at the beginning, we were told not to touch anything. There were people who were wearing triple gloves to the grocery store and uh, all these th things that, that we were told we were supposed to do. And then more information came in and the scientific picture developed and those recommendations changed. And when that began to happen, the public began to turn against the public health system. Well, you told us to do this, now you're telling us to do that. How can we believe anything you tell us if your advice is going to keep changing? Who are you and why should we believe you? That, I think, is a piece of what's happening with Jesus here. There's something about the presence of God that we think needs to look like we expect it to look. And if it doesn't, we're not quite sure we're going to believe. That then leads to the second key that's in this. And they took offense. At a very basic human level, I want to suggest to you that that's probably what you and I would have done too. Because it's the easiest thing to do. If you don't know what else to do, you might as well just be offended. You don't know how to, to, to join the parade. You're not sure you want to join the parade. This guy you knew came back to town with this enormous entourage of people you've never seen before. All these strangers who are messing up the village. Who are these people and what is their problem? easiest thing to do is to say, well, there's, there's something wrong with all this. Just, just go away. Let it be like it was before. I'm, I don't like this. But at a deeper level, I want to suggest to you that being offended is something we really should be careful to note and to root out from our own souls. Offense is really about what happens when someone owes you something and they don't pay. I owe you polite behavior. I, I'm your rector. I'm supposed to be nice to you. If I'm rude to you, you're offended. If one of you borrows money from somebody else and doesn't repay it, that person is offended because you were supposed to pay him back. You owe him the money. What do we owe God? What does it mean to take offense at God when we owe God absolutely nothing? In fact, God is very much on the positive side of the ledger with us all the time. Worth bearing in mind when we come to be in the presence of God to remember that. 
The third key that I see in it is this line, he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Again and again and again, we see in the gospel stories and indeed even in Acts, which we were just reading last month, the unclean spirits tend to be the ones who are in the best position to say who Jesus is. They usually know who he is. Indeed, they even know who the followers of Jesus are, like the, one, the, the girl who's possessed who comes up to Paul in Acts. There's something about the unclean spirits. Now, granted, they're, they're evil. They're, they're, they're not followers of Jesus. They're not following the, the, the will and commands of God. But I want to suggest to you that they're living in a spiritual realm. They, they, they live in a spiritual world. It might make us wonder just a little bit what it means that we don't always pick up on these things as quickly as the evil spirits seem to. Perhaps we are not living as much in a spiritual world as we ought to. We who are, in fact, followers of Jesus, who are doers of the commands and the will of God, at least we try. Maybe it's worth noticing sometimes where you have to be in order to recognize the presence of God. And then the fourth is, they shook off, sh shook off the dust from their feet. It's very dismissive. The, the least possible thing, the, the, the most worthless thing you could have found in this place, you're not even going to take that with you, to say nothing of anything that was of any actual value. Very dismissive. And yet, I want to suggest to you that there is a silver lining in that, because there's nothing that says you can't go back. Okay, you shook off the dust, but no reason you can't go back to it later. There is no reason ever to presume that having missed being in the presence of God today, there is no chance for it tomorrow. God opens that opportunity to us again and again and again and again. That door is always open to us. And with those as our keys, I think I can make a few observations about these stories. The first goes back to this deeds of power idea. It says that Jesus could not do any deeds of power when he went to his hometown, except that he healed a few people. So it wasn't like he couldn't do anything. Obviously, he could. He healed some people. Why was he able to do that and nothing else? I want to suggest to you that there's something about those cracks in our facade that enable the power and the glory of God to get in. When you're sick, when you're sad, when you're desperate, when you're hopeless, the cracks are showing, and somehow God is able to get in better than when they're not. How often is it our false sense of our own competence, our own sense that we have everything we possibly need, we're as powerful as we need to be, we can take care of ourselves? that forms such a solid shell around us that we can't even notice the presence of God. This is one of the observations around the world about where religion is still pretty active and where it seems to be fading away. It seems to be fading away quickest in those parts of the world where it seems like we've got everything figured out. We're rich enough, we're safe enough, we're happy enough. We can do whatever we need to take care of ourselves where in those parts of the world where there is the greatest poverty, there is the greatest sickness, the greatest despair, the greatest trouble, they at least recognize what it is they still need God for. Why is it, do you think, sometimes it's so difficult for us to worship? Why is it so hard for us simply to be in the presence of God and recognize it? I wonder if it's because we're so careful to paper over the cracks, so careful to look perfect, even in the presence of God, and somehow stuck inside that perfect shell, it's a lot easier to say, I won't even believe. The next is around what goes around this idea that a prophet is not without honor except in his or her own country. I've had occasion to tell you several times recently that a prophet is about truth-telling. What a prophet is doing isn't anything sort of a magic trick. A prophet is telling the truth. Now, it's the truth of God against which all other truth is to be measured, and it certainly is a truth that very often the world doesn't want to hear. 
But nonetheless, that's all it is, is truth. It's not saying you must do this, you must do that. It's simply saying, wake up and notice. The voice of God coming from the prophets is telling us, wake up, notice what's going on around you. Notice the brokenness of the world, but also notice the presence of God in the world. Prophet should be able to help us to get past our own disbelief by pointing out those things around us that are signs that any of us should be able to recognize. And then the third important point comes in the second part of the story where it says that Jesus sent out his followers with nothing, with a staff, but no, no bag, no money, No extra food, no extra clothes, none of those things that might make us better able to do those trips without relying on other people. This is an important message for 21st century Episcopalians. In general, we are better educated, wealthier, more socially connected than many of our neighbors. And it's very tempting for us to go out into the world and say, we are here with our resources, we are going to give you a solution to your problems. Plainly, that is not what Jesus told his followers to do, quite the opposite. Instead, I think the message is we are supposed to go out and say we are coming with nothing except ourselves, our presence, our promise to remain with you, to abide with you, to stay with you, and work with you to solve these problems that neither you nor we are able to solve without the help of God. It's a somewhat less holy example than from Narnia, but you remember in The Wizard of Oz when the the four main characters get to Oz and they go into the temple of Oz and there's the the huge head and the fire that that warped most of us as children. And we're looking at this this scene of they're, they're confronting what they think is the wizard until Toto the dog goes over and pulls back the curtain and shows the wizard is actually behind the curtain. That's the message, dear friends, that that the wisdom comes in the humble form. It's not in the, the, the show and the flash. The wizard who was behind the curtain had all the wisdom they needed. In fact, he was able to heal all of them in each of the way that they needed. How often do we fail to notice? How often do we scorn to notice the presence of God because it isn't quite flashy enough? How often are we tempted not to go out with nothing? The key in all of this is more or less where I began, that the door is always open. God is always present. God is always on tap, as it were. All we have to do is turn the knob and there God will be. God desires to be present with us. And that perhaps is a useful coda to all of this. Hidden in this is the other key message. God, the presence of God is something that we bear into the world, something that we carry with us just as his early, Jesus' Jesus early followers did. We too will face disbelief. We too will face scorn and rejection just as they did. All we can say is all they could say. The kingdom of God has come near to you has come near to me simply by trying to make it apparent to you. And in that, perhaps, one more crack is put into our own disbelief. A little more of the light of God gets in, and once again, we are able to see God present with us. Amen.